of course, I don't know how I got started in this. Uh, you know, I read, maybe it was Jack London said, he was walking down the street and he came to a corner and he didn't know whether to go this way or he didn't know whether to go that way. And finally he decided to go this way and there he met a guy that was going to sea and the guy had him get on the boat with him and they went out and this happened to his life and this happened to his life and this happened to his life and uh, he wondered what would I have been if I just turned the other way and gone down the street the other way. And maybe that's me when this kid came out to Idaho and I got acquainted with him. He says, I got some relatives up in Jackson Hole. I'm going up Jackson Hole. Do you want to go with me? Well, anybody that lived in Idaho didn't want to go to Jackson Hole because there were legends there. You know, there were elk and uh, there were trout and there were outlaws and, and uh, they uh, there, it was a great place, but there was also a lot of myths about Jackson Hole, Jackson's Hole that was a lot greater. So we started to hitchhike up there. And we come around the corner of Idaho Falls, and there was the Tetons out there. Now I'd gone to the Sawtooth with my older brothers. I had four of them. I'm the youngest one of nine children. And I went up there salmon fishing with them and hunting and Hell, I, I uh, carried a gun to school and shot pheasants on the way home. I was an outdoor kid. Uh, but here are these Tetons, and uh, I don't know who said it first, let's climb the Grand Teton. Okay, let's climb it. So uh, finally we got a ride over Teton Pass from Idaho, which is the only road then going into Jackson's Hole. You notice I say Jackson's Hole, it's Jackson Hole now to the tourist. But Jackson's Hole, Jackson was the old trapper in the beaver trapping days, and that's where he holed up for the winter. And over on the other side of the Tetons was Pierre's Hole, and Pierre was the trapper over there, and he holed up over there. So it was Jackson's Hole. But uh, I'll never forget going up to that pass. We stopped three or four times to put in water in this old Model T floored. And every time we put water in it, it would be like Old Faithful and shoot up. And then finally, it got so it wouldn't go anymore. The road became very steep. So he knew what to do. He turned it around, and we backed up the steeper part. And that was SOP in those days for Model Ts. Those of you who haven't been in the military, SOP is standard operating procedure. Because uh, they didn't have gas pumps in those days, and, and it's hard to make gas run uphill. And uh, the uh, tank was under the dashboard, and there was a hole in front of the windshield. But on a level road, the tank was higher than the carburetor, so the gas would run the carburetor. But if you started up like this, suddenly the gas tank got as low or lower than the carburetor, and for some reason the gas just wouldn't flow into the carburetor. So you turn it around and then you get the tank up above the carburetor. That's all it took. <laughs> And we had told him that we were going to climb the Grand Teton. And he was aghast. No human foot has ever been up there. I've been up there hunting mountain sheep, and nobody's ever going to climb that mountain. Well, I said, uh, we said, well, we heard that Billy, a fellow by the name Billy Owen, had climbed it in 1898. And he had some. Wyoming rancher with him by the name of Peterson. And the fellow says, well, I know old Pete lives up there on Mormon Row, and I guess if he said he got to the top, maybe he did. But he said, you kids have got no business going up there. And, uh, and then we got to the top of the pass, finally. And I'll never forget somebody, they had a sign out there, 
Howdy, stranger. <laughs> yonder, and I looked down yonder, that you saw the valley down there with the Snake River running through it. Yonder lies Jackson's Hole, the last of the Old West. That still thrills me when I think of that. But about that time, he commented in Jackson Hole Ease, uh, this don't have any brakes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little disconcerting. But he knew what to do. He got his axe out and chopped down a pine tree. We helped him drag it over and back of the ford. He t took out a chain, put it around the axle, and put it to the pine tree, and down we went. <laughs> Not only holding us back, but really smoothing out the road at the same time. <laughs> and we got down at the bottom, and he stopped and backed up a little bit, loosened the chain, and said, help me throw this over the bank. And, and uh, so we threw it over the bank, and I looked down there, and there were a lot more trees down there. <laughs> So we got into uh, we got into Jackson Hole. We asked where the Kellys lived, and and we went up there to meet Ralph Heron's relatives. And no sooner we got there than here came Jim Francis, the uh, then and later famous sheriff, and he was dressed like Hollywood. He had his hog leg on here and strapped on, and his boots and his stetson and. Your kids folks know you're here? I hear you're going to climb the Grand Teton. Don't think you should do it, boys. I think you should go home. <laughs> well, we didn't want to be deported, but uh, uh, we said we would contact him the next day. But luckily for us, and this probably changed my life too, Billy Owen, William O. Owen, who had run the baselines across your land out there, because you own a lot of land out west, you see. You didn't own anything back here because the king gave it all to some individual, but out there you made the Louisiana Purchase. That's all your land. And the only way it ever got out of your ownership was the fact that somebody homesteaded or had a mining claim, or they gave some to the railroads. It's still yours. Still yours. All the Forest Service land is yours. All the BLM land is yours. And a lot of the rest of it is yours. So you own a lot of land out there in Wyoming. You didn't know it, perhaps. <coughs> but Billy Owen was visiting there, and he heard the rumor, which I'm sure went through town like wildfire. Two damn fool kids are saying they're going to climb the Grand Teton. And we were kids, 16 years of age. And uh, Billy Owen heard this, and he sent a message up he wanted to talk to us. And we went down and talked to him, and he didn't discourage us. He told us the way he'd gone up in 1898, how he'd tried it six times before then in various places. But the last time they went up there, and they'd had the local blacksmith make some iron spikes that they were going to drive in and try to get up this wall that blocked them from uh, getting on the upper part of the mountain. But while they were there, they were looking around and they saw they could swing around the mountain a little bit and there was a, a ledge about that wide that they could crawl along looking down on the top of the pine trees three or four thousand feet below. And after they crossed, got across that crawl, he called it, there were some chimneys and they could climb up. And he told us all about it. And he even said that he'd get a car to take us over the wagon road and across the ferry. There was no bridge across the Snake River. Across the ferry and take us up the foot of the mountains. So we spent our last money for a few cans of pork and beans and some sardines. But we had our sleeping bags with us, which were made up of two patchwork quilts I'd taken from my mother's closet, perhaps unknown to her. And uh, so we, we were prepared to go. 
and he was taking us early in the morning. And we rolled up our sleeping bags and put the sardines and pork and beans and stuff inside there, and then tied a string around it and made a bow out of a horseshoe and put it over our neck. That was our pack. And at the last moment, somebody asked us if we had a pocket knife. And we said no, and they handed us a little pocket knife, luckily. So we went up there and went across the ferry and went up in front of the Tetons. He let us out. And here was a nice sunny day and the Grand Teton up there, six, 7,000 feet above us. And it didn't look hard at all. <laughs> didn't look hard at all. And so we took off, practically running toward Timberline. And then we decided, look, why waste all that energy? We're not going to go up that canyon and go up to that saddle and all the way around to the west side and come up the west side the way Owen did it. Because any damn fool could see that you could climb right up that east side. <laughs> and you see, I knew something about scrambling because we lived right on the edge of Snake River Canyon. We had to climb down there to fish and hunt and trap. As a matter of fact, I think we owned the place where Evil Knievel tried to jump the Snake River Canyon some few years ago. So I, I knew how to scramble. So there's no use going around there, up there. So, gosh, we all made almost record time getting to Timberline. And we, right there at the base of the East Ridge, we saw at the foot of the glacier, there was a lake there with a delta in it. We called it Delta Lake, it's still Delta Lake. But it, I don't think it was one o'clock yet. So why stop? We threw down our blankets with the pork and beans in them, and it was hot, we were sweating. So we left our sort of Levi-type coats there. So we took off up there in our cowboy-type boots with slick leather soles, one pair of bib overhauls and one blue shirt. I don't think we wore underwear in those days. <laughs> and up we went. And we scrambled and we were doing pretty good. And then suddenly we got up there and it was getting a little bit tougher. And we were looking way down. And, uh, but we kept going. And suddenly it started to get dark. Well, make a decision. Yep. No use going all the way back. There's a little crack here. We'll just stay here tonight, and when it gets daylight, we'll go on up. So it got dark, and then over in Pierre's hole, we heard Rip Van Winkle or somebody over there, and there was big noises coming out of Pierre's hole. And suddenly, black clouds roared over the Grand Teton. And I'll never forget it. You could see the lightning hitting the top of the peaks here and there and the thunder rumbling back and forth and re-echoing. I remember it now as a symphony. I didn't know what the word meant in those days. And then we had a little cloud burst. And we were very wet. And then the wind started to howl, and I mean howl. And then it started to snow. And that was the longest night in all history. <laughs> the water froze on the rocks, made ice. Now we mountaineers call that verglas. It was just ice in those days. <laughs> and, and the snow came on top of this ice, and that was slick. And next morning, we could move slowly. But uh, the only reason we survived is because uh, hyperthermia wasn't in the dictionary then. <laughs> so we never heard of it. <laughs> but we couldn't, no way were we going to get down the way we came up. But we saw down below us in this gully 
that's a cool bar now, but then it was a gully, uh, was sort of a big uh, platform. And we thought if we got down there, maybe we could get down another way. Uh, that's, that's a decision mountaineers should make very seriously, going down another way. But uh, we couldn't climb down there because the gully had filled up with ice and it was, oh, I don't think quite as high as this ceiling down to this platform. So we just slid down that ice down to that platform. And then we looked down there and uh, maybe it was starting to break, but the clouds were down below us too and it was snowing uphill then. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we looked over there and, and I picked up a big rock and I threw it over there and it hit. Now you see we we're getting good judgment by now. We we're developing our judgment. I knew that was too far to jump. <laughs> But then, gosh, we had to, we couldn't get down that way, so we wanted to get back up where we spent the night, get out of the wind. But we couldn't get up this ice tool bar. We used to trap, uh, shouldn't tell city the people this because I think it's awfully cruel. We used to trap mice on a ranch in a, a bucket. You'd put something in the bottom of the bucket and then you'd put a little stick up through the bucket and they'd climb up there and jump down in the bucket and then they couldn't get back out. And that's the way we were. We were trapped there. We couldn't get back out. And I think by that time we were crying. We knew we were dead. But we'd been reading Zane Gray, so we were going to die fighting. <laughs> So, our trusty pocket knife, with a blade that long, chopping a handhold, chopping a foothold, chopping another handhold, chopping another handhold. Well, in about an hour and a half, we chopped our way with this pocket knife up to the top and back to where we spent the night. And the reason I'm here today is because at that time the clouds parted. The storm was over as suddenly as it came. And that happens in the mountains. The sun came out bright. Water started to run. The snow started to melt. And the sparrows came out and started hopping around on the snow again. They're rosy finches now, but in those days they were sparrows. <laughs> and by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it had melted enough so we could get back down and by dark we were down to our sleeping bags. And where we ate most of our food in big gulps and went to sleep and woke up the next morning and ate some more and decided what we were going to do. And we just couldn't go back to Jackson. We couldn't go back and face those cowboys. By God, I ain't lost nothing up there. Damn fools, why does anybody want to climb a mountain? I'll ride my horse up there when they get a trail up there. <laughs> so, hope springs eternal within the human breast, especially if you're 16 years old. So we decided we'd try it again. <laughs> but we were a little sorry. We, we knew in order to get, now we had to traverse around the whole mountain to get over to the other side where we were supposed to be in the first place. And that was a bunch of snow fields, some of which were very steep. So we took our trusty pocket knife and whittled some sticks out of the little pine trees there. And then with one of those in each hand, by getting up the next morning without breakfast, because that day when we were resting, we'd consumed all the food. Without breakfast, we started traversing around the mountain with these sticks so we could climb up the steep snow. 
And we got around finally to the own route. And, believe it or not, made the top. Beautiful, calm, sunny day. And then we've come, when we got down to where the snow fields were that would lead back to our sleeping bags, our judgment was a little better then. We knew we could not get down that because it was evening and the snow had hardened and we knew we couldn't get down. So we came on down the canyon and then we had to climb way up a wall and over a ridge and way down to our uh, sleeping bags. It was a moonlit July, July night and we managed to get back there at 3 o'clock in the morning. And so we had a couple of hours sleep before cutting up one of my mother's patchwork quilts and wrapping it around our feet since the soles of our shoes were gone. <laughs> and heading down to the road, uh, I th uh, maybe later or even then, I thought we looked like George Washington crossing the Delaware, all bundled up in our new shoes. But luckily, a car came by. That day, somebody managed to get through from Yellowstone. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the ranchers used to go up there and camp all summer so that they could pull the cars through at least one place that was always bad. They had to hitch onto the cars and pull them about a mile through the swamp so they could get from Yellowstone to Jackson Hole. But he came by and picked us up and took us into the square in the middle of Jackson. And Jackson wasn't very big in those days. And everybody in town came out. They even stopped the poker game in the saloon. <laughs> they all come out. And they all looked at us and looked at our feet too. <laughs> And ask us if we got on top of the Grand Teton, sure. You know, and they looked like these kids are lying, you know. But Billy Owen was still there. And pretty soon he came running up through there and started to ask us questions. And we told him how we'd gotten to the top and how we had crawled across the crawl and how we had found this pennant that he'd left up there in 1898, a little metal pennant that said Rocky Mountain Club on it and that the light, it had 16 holes in it from lightning, and that we'd found the jar with his name inside, so forth and so forth. And he put his hand on our shoulders and dramatically turned to the crowd and said, these young men have been to the very top of the Grand Teton. <laughs> well, I've never topped that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Ralph's folks had heard about his endeavors, and he went home. But my mother had raised nine children, and, and she never discouraged me from my adventurous endeavors. And a rancher came up, uh, Bill Lucas, came up and said, I hear you're a farm boy, and I said, yeah. He said, can you stack hay? And I said, as sure in hell can. He said, well, I'll buy you a pair of boots and why don't you come out and work for me? So the next day I was out stacking hay. And uh, word got around that these kids had gotten up the mountain. And I suppose the dudes thought, gosh, if these kids can get up there, maybe we could get up there. And we had the dude ranches in those days, you know where people come out and played cowboy all summer, some of them. <laughs> you know, from the main line, Philadelphia, from Boston, other places, uh, big dude ranches. And uh, so people started to talk about going up there. And these guys appeared down there and said they wanted to talk to me, and I jumped off the haystack, and they said, did you really get to the top of the Grand Teton? And I used my boyhood expression, sure in hell did. And uh, they said, would you show us the way up? They didn't say guide. They said, show us the way up. And I said, sure. 
And they said, uh, how much would you charge? And I don't know today why I said this, because I was being paid as the same as the other cowboys there, working in the hay fields and otherwise, which in those days was a dollar a day in board. But I guess maybe I thought of the hyperthermia, which I didn't know what it was called then. And I said, how about a hundred bucks? <laughs> well, that staggered them a little. They said, we'll talk it over. And so they went back and I went to pitch it. Hey, they talked for a while. They come back and yelled up. Uh, and so I jumped off and they said, when can we start? I said, how about tomorrow? <laughs> Four days later, I was back stacking hay with the summer wages in my pocket. I had a future. I had a racket. <laughs> I, I was a guide. And that year, I took up four more parties, and the next year, I come back, and in a couple of years, I was training my own guides. And of course, the number of great climbers who came from the guide service in the Tetons is phenomenal. So that's how the bear lost his tail, and that's how those little things that happen in your life affect you so much.